What we're seeing is that companies are bringing together multiple AI capabilities within a single platform. And this is especially the case in AI multilingual video and audio, where we've had all of those advances in speech technology just over the last 12 months. And welcome everyone to another episode of Slater Pod. Today's special guest, head of research, Anna Windham, who's going to discuss uh, and tell us a bit more about our just launched 50 under 50 language AI startup index. So hi, Anna. Hi, Esther. Hi, Florian. Hi, Florian. Hi, Esther. All right. Just before that, two weeks left for SlaterCon Remote uh, coming up in two weeks. Still time to get the tickets. Great lineup. So go check out the agenda. Also, May 23rd, SlaterCon London. A lot of people are coming. So this is going to be great. Fancy hotel in the middle of London. So looking forward to seeing everybody there. So today on the agenda, we're going to talk a bit about Disney uh, language AI investment. They have an accelerator that is investing in a couple of language AI startups. Then we're going to talk about Anthropic's new, I don't know what it's called, like LLM Claude, Claude, Claude in French. Uh, it seems to do well in low resource translation. Uh, we're going to be talking a bit more what it actually means if a lawsuit drops in English. Uh, going to talk about Japanese LSPs. Honyaku's performance, and there were a couple of layoffs in the lock department, or some layoffs in the in Sega's localization department. But first, Anna, tell us more about the index that we just launched, the or the list uh, which we call Slater Language AI 50 Under 50. What is why is it called 50 Under 50? What does it mean? And uh, yeah, tell us more. Yeah, exciting day. We just uh, published the list. So the Slater Language AI 50 Under 50 is a snapshot of 50 of the newest and most notable language AI companies. So these are companies that are building on um, language AI capabilities like speech to text, machine translation, speech synthesis, uh, text into image, text into video, and so on. And we also put a spotlight on uh, some of the new players who are building AI models and collecting the data that underpins them, as well as um, companies offering innovative localization workflow. So more of the traditional kind of language uh, technology company. So it's 50 of the the newest and brightest and most interesting companies that have popped up in the last uh, 50 months. 50 months, right? Yeah. Because usually uh, I think this, uh, isn't it the Forbes thing that's called 30 under 30? Yeah. So this is not 50 companies under 50 years or with founders at under 50, which I'd still qualify. Um, but 50 companies that are under 50 months old. Was there any reason to do the cutoff at 50 months other than 40 under 40 or 30 under 30 would be a little less comprehensive? I think what we're trying to do is really capture what's happening and what's changing. So as these new AI capabilities are popping up, um, obviously we have language service providers and translation management systems acting very quickly to integrate those capabilities. But at the same time, we have all of these kind of standalone SaaS subscription platforms popping up and offering these capabilities in kind of user-friendly platforms and making them accessible to uh, individuals, but also to uh, teams and enterprises. So um, the idea of narrowing the scope is to kind of put a spotlight on what's happening and what's changing and understand what are some of the, uh, the themes that are emerging in terms of where the most activity is. Um, we have six categories, uh, AI multilingual video and audio, AI content creation, real-time speech translation, AI transcription, uh, localization tech, and AI stack. And we've really seen a lot of new companies pop up in that multilingual video and audio segment, uh, as well as the, the content creation uh, space as well. All right. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, we just started sharing that, um, just spun up that list. So that, that the map basically is right. So yeah, we have, there we have language applications, lang localization tech and the AI stack. And within that we have AI multilingual video and audio, which is very well populated. So a lot is happening in that area. And then multilingual content, AI multilingual content, also very well populated. AI real-time speech translation, which you just mentioned, AI transcription, workflow optimization, AI integration, AI models, and data for AI. What was kind of for you the big theme 
in, this year as opposed to last year, because this is the second time we're running this. So we we ran this uh, about a year ago, and now this is the second time. And just for clar uh, just for clarity, we don't feature any companies that were featured last year. So this is an entirely fresh batch of companies, right? Exactly. And a really clear theme has emerged, um, and that is that there's a movement away from narrow single use case platforms towards more comprehensive platforms. So last year we had a category dedicated just to AI dubbing and a category dedicated just to speech synthesis. Uh, but what we're seeing is that companies are bringing together multiple AI capabilities um, within a single um, platform. And this is especially the case in AI multilingual video and audio where we've, we've had all of those advances in speech technology um, just over the last 12 months, it's now possible to clone clone your voice with just three seconds uh, of uh, audio sample. Uh, there are lots more options in terms of adjusting the nuances of the voices that you're using. So this is where the um, activity is really occurring. And we see companies like uh, Camp AI that don't just offer uh, AI dubbing, but also AI subtitling and other companies that don't just offer AI dubbing, but might also offer AI avatars and uh, video generation and speech to text capabilities. So there's a kind of a bigger, I guess a bolder move into the media localization space here. And it's a combination of generative capabilities, uh, localization capabilities, and also these new options for tweaking and personalizing and customizing uh, the kind of audio uh, and video and uh, speech uh, that you're producing. So it's this multimodality, which we spoke a lot about maybe 18 months ago or 12 months ago in kind of a research setting more, right? These Now we're seeing this kind of being brought into actual products that people are starting to market. Yeah, and we'd expect, I think we would expect more of that to happen over the next 12 months, especially with, for example, Meta releasing their seamless uh, model, which kind of dissolves the boundaries between speech and text and makes it possible to convert between speech and text and convert between languages all within a, a single model. So this will also um, make it easier to create these uh, multimodal and multilingual <laughs> platforms. They open sourced this, I believe, right? That was maybe about six months ago. Maybe. I thought it was a bit less, actually. But yeah, time is, time is moving fast. <laughs> Seamless, yeah, from, from Meta, like nine, 99 or 100 languages. Uh, anything else particularly interesting that you saw uh, also compared to the last year? Yeah, in the article, we kind of referred back to Sadecon Zurich in October 2023, and we had um, a language industry investor there, uh, Fernando Chueca from Carlisle, and he basically identified this expansion from localization to content creation as a big opportunity for language service providers and language tech providers. And we also see these standalone startups moving into this area. So we have this um, platform called uh, A Lasa, and it brings together AI writing with translation, transcription, speech synthesis, image and text generation, all in a kind of uniform uh, platform. And a couple of the other platforms there are doing that uh, as well. And I guess the other kind of um, interesting thing that's happening is we have a couple of startups here, Birdhouse and Mabel, who are building on real-time speech, speech to speech translation capabilities. Uh, so in the last uh, 12 months, all of the components of speech to speech translation, that's uh, text into speech and then machine translation and then speech synthesis. Is that the right way around? No, speech into text, then machine translation, then speech synthesis. So those have really improved. Uh, latency is improved, and that means it's now possible to inject real-time speech, uh, speech translation capabilities into platforms much more easily than in the past. Um, the first movers were those um, interpreting platforms, but now we have these uh, standalone platforms, Birdhouse, is mainly focusing on uh, conferences and Mabel is mainly focusing on uh, speech to speech uh, translation for medical interactions. Birdhouseapp.com. Um, so you're saying they are focused on conferences, not on conference calls, but on conferences? Yeah, uh, real time multilingual conferences and meetings. So a very similar space to 
um, Interprefy, um, Interprefy's Avia and Kudo. And we also see, obviously, um, I think Zoom and a couple of the other uh, major conferencing platforms have tried to inject a bit of um, real-time speech translation, speech to text, I think, just captioning for the moment. Um, but so they're kind of all in the same sp space now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're saying on their w website, AI power real tra translation in voice captions for your meetings, calls, and chats, birdhouse with a Y that is. Um, wow, okay. Um, so anything else? I mean, in terms of geography, I think when I connected to a lot of the founders, I saw that there, there are a lot of companies coming out of India. There are so many companies coming out of India across all of these uh, segments that you can see um, if you're watching um, the video version that you can see on screen, um, but also uh, in the AI stack or what we're calling the AI stack. And by that we mean, we mean these are startups that are building original AI models for um, what we're seeing as Indian and, and African languages and starting to build up that uh, those models the cloud platforms and the infrastructure needed um, to basically, we would expect um, to kind of spur on the creation of more of these types of companies um, that are able to um, to work with Indian and African languages. Yeah, this is something quite quite new that uh, we're seeing so much activity. I mean, we've you know if you had Dubverse in last year's list, uh, we've also had Dubverse in the podcast. Check that out. That's about a year old. Uh, but yeah, there's just so much coming out of uh, so much coming out of India. I think it's one of the, the one of the fastest growing uh, AI SaaS platform in general, beyond even beyond language. One of the fastest uh, uh, regions for for new entrants. Interesting. Uh, so this is this is freely available on the website. No, yeah, no, no, it's not gated. No access, anything like that. It's out now. You can go and uh, have a look at the logo map and you can um, dig into the kind of interactive list that we have there. You can click on different company names, find out a little bit more about them. You can read their elevator pitch, see what their multilingual capabilities are and uh, see what uh, what tech they're built on, what AI tech they're built on. Now, you, your team put this list together. How hard was it to curate this? How hard was it to find the companies in the first place? Like, I mean, is it just uh, we can, you know, basically select from a group of 500 or was it a bit of a, a research effort actually getting the relevant companies onto onto one, uh, like a map like this? So we started with kind of a, a broad pool of around 300 uh, companies that we uh, that we, we examined. It was definitely harder this year uh, compared to last year to get to 50 that fit within this criteria of being under 50 months old. Uh, there were so many interesting companies that are older than 50 months old that are doing super interesting things uh, with AI right now, language technology companies. Um, so we weren't able to include those. Um, so that did make it a bit more difficult. But on the other hand, uh, there's quite a there's quite a lot of activity, as we mentioned, in the video and audio and content space. Uh, so a lot of these companies that, that are in the list um, just... Um, were founded just in the last uh, 12 months or 18, 18 months. It's extremely ambitious if you look at it in the, in the sense that we found 100 companies over the past uh, 12 months, because if you include the 2023 version, right, and this one. So it's 100 new companies that are less than 50 months old. Many of them are like maybe more 20 or 30 month old, right, a couple of years old, that are now, and that have entered the language technology, language AI space. So this this is a lot of new companies. I think if we had tried to do the same exercise maybe five years ago, I guess there would the hall would have been a lot smaller. I I, I would guess. So it's yeah. I mean, I guess my point is just an incredibly active space. Yeah, if, if we'd done it a few years ago, the emphasis would have been in that on the localization category with the new translation management systems. Uh, new cut tools and editing tools in terms of what language technologies uh, are appearing. Um, but there's only, we were only able to find a, a handful of those types of companies uh, for the list this year. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it, it's a big market, but it's not like a $2 trillion market. So, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of heat on anybody, 
entering this and all of the incumbents. Um, now, all right. Well, Anna, that was that was fantastic. Stay on, stay, please stay on, uh, because we're yeah we're we're going to talk about some other things where you were actually more expert than any of us. So first, first though, Esther, why don't you tell us a bit more about Disney? Because there's one overlapping company because Disney invested. They have like a, an accelerator, and there was one company that was in in our list, but also in on Disney's accelerator. Well, I was going to say maybe Disney consulted uh, the 50 under 50 last year because um, Eleven Labs was in, I believe, the 2023 version of the 50 under 50. So, <laughs> so there we go. Maybe uh, Disney took a look at the look at the uh, 50 under 50 last year. Um, regardless, uh, so yeah, the Disney Accelerator program. Um, this is a program that's run by Disney. It's been running for 10 years, um, whereby Disney is. Um, sort of aiming to add innovation and look at cutting edge technology within um, the entertainment space. Um, and yeah, kind of has this incubator accelerator program, as you said, uh, for startups that are venture backed, uh, growth stage. Um, and yeah, two. So this year, I think there are five companies that made this the cohort, 2024 cohort. Um, two of which, so it's quite a, a good percentage, are actually language AI startups. Um, so 11 labs that we mentioned um, and also a company called Audio Shake. Um, so, yeah, which I think is a great name. So 11 labs um, is a multilingual AI voice startup. It also recently opened its own dubbing studio and has, I think, in, in just earlier this year, actually raised 80 million US dollars in a series B. Yeah, they, they've been very active. I saw them. I mean, they, it's like, hey, Jen, they went kind of viral much beyond the kind of narrower industry that, we're, I mean, that, that is typically looking at this, right? This was almost, uh, I got, I saw them mentioned in many, many other kind of media outlets, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And the other, um, language AI startup that's part of this Disney Accelerator program in 2024 is AudioShake, which uses AI to parse audio tracks for mixing and dubbing. Um, so they mentioned one of the use cases there is, is localization. Um, so yeah, getting a fair amount of attention, um, <laughs> localization language um, from Disney's Accelerator program. Um, and then other topics, I mean, obviously there are three other companies on in that program Nothing to do, uh, as far as we can tell, with language AI, but um, there's one which focuses on immer immersive experiences for sports gaming and another that uses um, natural language prompts to develop tools for virtual world creation. So I guess it's a bit of an insight into some of the areas that Disney finds compelling um, and interesting at the moment. Yeah, I wonder what comes with I mean, I think... Um... There's no IP. They don't need to pass on any IP, or I think they retain all of the IP, but probably Disney just wants to keep these companies super close because, I mean, if one of them blows up, it could be, I mean, blows up in a, in popularity, I mean, or or use case. Uh, it, it, they want to keep them very close uh, and, and understand what's going on there. Well, um, challenging for anybody who's in the... Uh, in, in that space as well. It's just very disruptive. If all of a sudden you have these kind of voices at the click of a mouse, right? So let's go one layer down or a couple layers down to more of these foundational models, you know, the, the open AIs, the coheres, uh, or anthropic AI, who or which launched a new model called Claude 3 Opus. And I came across a tweet or... I still don't know what to call this. What do we call this? An X? An X post? A tweet. Yeah, we know what we know what you mean. I came across a tweet by by a handle called ha 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 ho ho he. Um that's that's the handle. So it's an anonymous account by somebody calling themselves An Chi. Um that was testing that new Claude model. A uh, lucky person because I wasn't able to test it because it said my region wasn't available yet. So it looks like you can only use it in the US for now. And then the tweet reads, Today, while testing Anthropic's new model Claude 3 Opus, I, I witnessed something so astonishing. It genuinely felt like a miracle. Hate to sound clickbaity, but this is really what, I what it felt like. Um, what was this about? So that person apparently is a Circassian speaker. 
I had to Google that. So Circassian is the language that is, what the, the people basically are an indigenous Northwest Caucasian ethnic group and the nation and native to the historical country region of Circassia in North, North Caucasus. And, you know, we know that the Caucasus is a very linguistically diverse and complex region. There's a lot of, uh, you know, as usually happens in the mountains, people get stuck and they develop their own languages. Um, and so this is, uh, I never heard about Circassian. I gotta, um, uh, gotta admit here, but that individual that tweeted has been working on NLP for that person's mother tongue, again, Circassian for the past two years. Uh, the person says Circassian is very low research a low resource language with ne negligible internet presence. It's part of this, you know, Circassian, Abkhaz, isolated language group, meaning they have no related languages, you know, like Basque or something where we just don't really know where it comes from, except with Basque. I think the one link that some people mention is it's the Georgian language, which happens to be in the, the Caucasus. Anyway, so that person said it's a comp the, the, the Circassian is complex morphology and limited data make it a serious challenge for language models. Now, what did that person do? Uh, not expecting much at all. I asked, it was the person tweeted, I asked it to translate a simple sentence. I am lying in the bed from Russian to a Circassian. Claude not only provided a perfect translation, but also broke down the grammar and morphology. So uh, they fed that uh, the, the new model, the new Claude model, with very limited um, uh, context or very limited data that they have been collecting kind of on, as kind of as a hobby, right? For the past two years. Uh, and then, boom, that uh, Claude started translating a low-resource language um, so well that that person's mind was blown. So, very interesting. Uh, we should link to the tweet in, in the show notes. So, ha head over there. It's a very, very long tweet, very detailed, and kind of lays out that experiment. But, uh, yeah, super interesting that, uh, you know, a new model is out, and that new model can do low-resource languages in languages that I've never heard of. I guess it indicates that all of these different techniques for uh, getting around the low resource problem, they're starting to to really have an impact. So synthetic data, uh, cross-training, well, I don't know the, the correct technical term, but um, feeding in a, a, a few small examples into um, an existing model, a multilingual model. Um, and I think probably also speech to text is helping here because there might not be a huge amount of this language uh, written on the internet, but with speech to text now, once you can get it into text form, uh, then it just makes it a lot easier uh, to to get the volumes of data uh, that are going to make a difference. It's very interesting that maybe it's just not such an incredibly hard problem anymore to get to a baseline of like, okay, machine translation or very good machine translation, despite the data challenges, right? So maybe we're kind of getting to that 80, 90% level with very little data, which is, which is incredible. Actually, I mean, this is, this is like a very positive thing. Imagine like these, you know, five, 6,000 low resource languages out there that are now kind of opening up to the world before that it was just not possible. And now you may get to read or yeah, maybe even like, you know, have basic conversations with people that just don't speak another language it will be very interesting. Um, now. Let's go back to something a bit more mundane. So Elon Musk sued OpenAI, and uh, you know we read through the lawsuit. We uh, found out that, uh, or in the lawsuit that Elon Musk filed against OpenAI. We're not going to go into details. Go read it up somewhere else. Uh, there's probably 500 other podcasts that are analyzing that lawsuit in detail. But um, one of the points was that um, the like machine translation got a shout out as basically being the first. Um, the first use case for large language models after the transformer uh, was kind of created, right? The transformer being uh, the core element now still of these these large language models today. So machine translation got a shout out as the first use case. Posted this, I posted this on LinkedIn and basically said Elon Musk's or Elon quote Elon Musk lawsuit against Sam Altman OpenAI just dropped. Translation gets a shout out as a key early use case for large language models. All right, gets a few likes, gets a few shares. One person commented that uh, he'd be interested to know if AI can actually translate just dropped well, because it's a bit, I don't know, you tell me, you guys are native English speakers, it's a bit of a slangy way of putting it. 
So, I mean, the lawsuit just dropped. It's not like somebody dropped the lawsuit, right? Which would literally mean the opposite. I mean, this is the lawsuit just dropped. I think it's because, yeah, there's no, there aren't any verbs in that sentence <laughs> apart from dropped. So it, maybe I think it, it's very compact. It's very compact. Yeah. I was busy. Yeah. <laughs> Being concise. Yeah. And then you asked, so you followed up and you actually put it into ChatGPT. What happened? Well, yeah, I followed off of my own interest because I think the person who posted, um, as far as I could tell, was a German and English speaker. And unfortunately, I wasn't, I'm not in a position to evaluate German machine translation. But I thought when I read, I reread your, um, your post and thought, oh, yeah, actually, that is a bit tricky um, for potentially anybody or <laughs> a human and or machine to, to parse. Uh, so really out of curiosity, I went over to um, OpenAI and asked it to translate that sentence from English into French. Elon Musk lawsuit against Sam Altman slash OpenAI just dropped. Um, and so what I got when I did this, I think it was Thursday or Friday last week, was essentially the translation or back translation saying the um, lawsuit had been dropped or abandoned. So the lawsuit had been dropped, not lawsuit dropped in the way that you intended it, rather uh, talking about the fact that the lawsuit has been abandoned, has just been abandoned, in fact, in the French. Um, so which is not was not your intended meaning um, at all. And for anybody who sort of read or clicked the link would, would be immediately obvious that that was not uh, the meaning of the post at all. And you went on to do some further digging. I went on to do some further digging. So after you showed me this, I put it into DeepL and DeepL also got it the wrong way. It basically translated it into German as it was dropped, right? The lawsuit was dropped. Um, so no more lawsuit. Um, now the second part of the sentence, so translation gets a shout out or of the post, translation gets a shout out as a curly use case for large language models. Uh, was translated quite well. So that that was well done. Then I went out and put it into ChatGPT, like you did for French, but then I asked it to translate into German. It got it right. It got the first part right. So it got the Elon Musk um, basically filed a lawsuit against Sam Altman. It used a very kind of formalish register. So it was kind of wrong on the register side. It wasn't kind of a slangy way of putting it, but it was correct. It was the correct translation. The problem was in the second part, uh, the translation gets a shout out as an early use, a key early use case for large language models. So what it did was, ChatGPT that is, it created one of those long German words uh, out of key early use case. Like it, I mean, I got, I'm going to have to read it. So it, it, for those of you who speak German, it called it a sch Schlüsselfrühbeispiel, which basically key early example that word doesn't exist. No, that, that, just not a word. Like it just takes the, it took those four English words and kind of mushed them into one long German word, but that, that word didn't exist. It's kind of, it's a weird word. I, I Google it. There's, it, there's zero examples of it on the, on the internet. So on the one hand, it got the first part, right? On the other, it butchered on the, like in the second part, it kind of butchered that part. So yeah, weird. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but funny. But then you put it again into uh, in French, right? You tried it again, and then it got it right in French, like today when we recorded this. Yeah, I didn't look quite exactly what it had said, but I remember seeing seeing that it had under understood and interpreted it correctly. Um, yeah. So who knows what's been going on there? <laughs> but Anna, let's let's. Why would it take this word key early use case and just kind of? make up a word. How, Anna, like why? It, 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 <laughs> why, it, Anna? Why? And it cannot have seen that it's impossible that this was on the internet anywhere. This word doesn't exist. Nobody ever used this word. So it's it's clearly aware of the phenomenon of of the German language creating these compound nouns. Uh, but it is unexpected that it's uh, it's creating its own original combinations. It's coining, it's coining its own terms. <laughs> uh, 
I was going to say, I wonder if, because you didn't say a key early use case, the original says gets a shout out as key early use case. So again, I think maybe the whole contraction element, skipping, you know, skipping, what would you call that? Sort of pronouns, adverbs and things like this. That's probably a really good example of where, um, where integrating different large language model capabilities really comes in handy. So injecting that context around uh, that piece of text, like this is a this is a LinkedIn post. It's much more likely to understand that there's some, maybe some uh, omissions that the the language is going to be a bit more jargony. Could have linked to the LinkedIn post and said, or linked to you, linked to your profile, saying this is a post by, <laughs> you know, by Florian Fays. I just sometimes wonder, like, we're like t when when this Claude model dropped. <laughs> no, when they launched the 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 Claude model, like uh, yesterday, right? So the the tweets I saw were like, "Oh, is how sentient is Claude? Like, are have we reached like a semi AGI state? Because well, the thing kind of did a good job at certain benchmarks, and then like you saw this, like, are, have we reached like some type of AGI now? Is this thing sentient? But then like you're putting like a basic high resource machine translation into ChatGPT. I'm not on 3.5, I'm on the paid four model, everything. And then it like starts making up words, right? But that is sentient though, isn't it? Like humans make up words. So maybe the AI is giving itself permission to, to make up words. I mean, I think it's, it's touching on a key point about large language models in general, which is that uh, there is this problem, the, you know, the black box problem for which there's a whole new field of research is emerging, which is to understand how it, how it, how it comes to its own, how it, what reasoning it uses or how it comes to its own um, decisions. And the other, the other characteristic is that at any point it can come up with something completely different to what it's come up with before, even though it's the same model, even though the training data hasn't, hasn't changed. Um, so it's always some it, this uh, that characteristic of AI in general is always something is always going to be part of the context. Um, there's always going to be this element of of unpredictability. Yeah, I, I'm 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 a little bit torn about this. I mean, yeah, you, you, what's it called? Interpretability, right? That's the sub genre there or the sub uh, research area, like actually knowing what's going on in that black box box. All right, look, let's, uh, I could I could argue for, or like I could discuss this forever. I just find it so weird that it's making up these words and that it kind of stumbles on like what is a fairly basic machine translation while, yeah, people on Twitter say we basically have this like, you know, revolutionary, like, uh, you know, artificial general intelligence. So, uh, all right, so let's take a step away from AI and go to the exciting world of Japanese listed companies' financial results. Let's do this very briefly and just close up. Esther, what happened with Honyaku Center? Are they growing? Are they shrinking? Are they making money or not? Maybe all of the above in different sectors, different areas of the business. Um, so yeah, Honyaku Center is Japan's largest uh, LSP. They release financial results uh, for Q3. Uh, 2024. So this is the three months to the end of December, uh, 2023. Um, that they they normally sort of uh, compile all the data, so it it's like an update on the nine months um, to that period. So they in those nine months uh, have revenues of 55 million US dollars. Um, this is up three, just over three percent from the previous corresponding period. So yeah, on a top on a sort of top line level, three percent growth from the year before. Um, Pre-tax was down, in operating income was down a bit, um, but they have um, sort of on a forecast level, maintaining forecasts for the full year uh, at around USD six, uh, 76 million US dollars for the full year. So they've got another three months to make up that gap. Um, so how on Yaku's business lines, they've got translation, interpreting, temporary staffing and conventions, and then a mysterious other segment. Um, translation accounts for a uh, vast majority of uh, of revenues and translation was practically flat um, in over uh, that period. Um, so total of just over 40 million US dollars um, in the nine months. Uh, uh, within that, so we had uh, finance and legal up 
around 5%, patent translation up around 6 7%, pharma, uh, but for, uh, patent being quite a small, patent translation being quite a small part of their business. Pharma down around 8%, um, and they said there was a decline in orders from drug developers. Um, industry and manufacturing also down, um, but just by a, a relatively small amount. Um, interpreting, so away from the translation business line, then interpreting did well, up around 25, 26%, uh, but still a smaller part of the business overall, so around five and a half million US dollars uh, in those nine months. Temporary staffing up um, to around similar level, six million US dollars. Um, and then the other, the other areas of the business are equally quite small, so conventions was up by quite a lot, but still smaller, around just over one million US dollars and other the mysterious other category down 6% to just under $2 million. And so that's a whistle-stop tour of what's happening at Honyaku, according to their financial results. Honyaku Center, translation center, actually. In English. So, yeah, interested. I mean, the, the one data point that really confirms what we saw in our language service provider index is that interpreting is up everywhere, even in Japan. So... Now, what's not up is the staff count at Sega of America. Why? What's going on? Esther, tell us more. We want to know why. Uh, <laughs> I'm not behind the decision making. I don't know. Um, but no, it seems to be quite a lot of layoffs happening across some of the gaming companies at the moment. So yeah, not limited to Sega um, of America, but also some job cuts at sort of EA and various of the Microsoft um, brands as well. Um, Sony's PlayStation division as well. Um, and also Sega that, that we covered editorially. So uh, the story that we covered is that Sega of America is letting go of 61 temporary workers across uh, the QA and localization functions. So these are people who are probably working on fixed term contracts um, will be let go as of um, the 8th of March. So a couple of days from now. Uh, it seems like there has been negotiations and there have been a, a union representing um, Sega workers to try and... Um, well, speak up on their behalf. Um, and that meant that some of the temporary workers have now been offered full, full-time full positions, 18 of them um, post-negotiation compared to, I think, six, as Sega was originally proposing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, what's interesting here is is sort of what that might mean more so from sort of a, a workflow and demand perspective when it comes to uh, game localization and game translation. How are they going to source and staff um, these areas if if they have fewer in-house um, in-house um, capabilities or in-house staff? So yeah, potentially sort of now relying more so on a mix of in-house talent, but from other divisions. Um, you know, I don't know QA across other um, areas of the business potentially, um, and then probably also then supplementing that by outsourcing. Um, some areas of the work um, and it's actually something that I, I remember reading back in you know keywords um, the large game localization game services provider uh, they consistently cite sort of um, how, how do they put it I think increased demand for outsourcing or in, increased outsource increased trend towards outsourcing among game gaming companies um, as sort of a macro driver of game localization and gaming services generally. So that this seems to be an example of where a company might be moving in that direction um, towards favoring external providers for certain certain solutions. One of those external providers, maybe now Keywords, because they actually also announced, I vaguely remember some layoffs um, in, in Ireland or something. But yeah, I think we put that in our sweep daily subscriber email. All right, well, so... Let's close it by sending everybody to our 50 under 50 language AI um, index list. Uh, great, uh, well compiled, compiled by Anna and our research team. So super interesting. And I uh, hope to see some of these companies at Slatercon London in May. All right, take care.